welcome to another session of numerical matters for mathematical finance. Uh, and we started a session on computer arithmetic. And we first introduced uh, the integers and then already started introducing the floating point numbers. So let me shortly recall the definition of the floating point numbers and we will do more nice experiments related to the um, arithmetic operations on the floating point numbers. So as a recap, yeah, we use three integers to represent these numbers as the sign C more or less the value E an exponent uh, specifying the scale. And there were three parts of the definition. So the first parts were the normalized floating point numbers. So basically there is the sign of course here in front, then there is here some stuff that is between uh, one and two, and there is the um, exponent two to the power of um, E. And the E came from E min to E max, the C became came from uh, zero included two to the power of P not included. So this is an interval one included uh, two not included. The second part were the uh, denormalized floating point numbers. So we also have the sign in front and then uh, some stuff. Uh, now discretizing the interval between zero and one and um, a fixed um, exponent uh, e min. So there's a two to the power of e min. Uh, yeah, let me just again uh, comment on this representation in this picture. And then I will also um, add a few other things to this picture. So we had here the exponents coming from the normalized floating point numbers. So we had the normalized, the normalized floating point numbers X. So we had the sine minus one to the power of S times one plus C divided by two to the power of P times two to the power of E. And the E was in between say an E min and an E max. Okay, these were these numbers. So the exponent here is given, uh, giving us these blue points and then this discretization of the interval, say, okay, this is the interval from one to two gave us the points in between. Okay, those are now the, here the queen guys, the points in between. And of course, also for C equals zero, then this boundary. Um, and we already saw that there is a gap. So the gap that is here missing The gap that is missing there are the denormalized floating point numbers. So there were the denormalized floating point numbers. Okay, and uh, yeah, if you go back to the definition, it's uh, minus one to the power of S and now it's C divided by two to the power of P two to the power of E min. Okay, and um, let me just rewrite this. Yeah? So maybe I need a bit more space. So I write it below here. So instead of the E min, I now write E plus one. And I just say that the E is then E min 
minus one. Okay, that's the same, right? And instead of the e plus one, I write two times two to the power of e. And now you see that what's actually happening here is that we take more or less the same representation. So there is the sign here in front. Okay, there's also the sign here in front. And there is the scale here at the end, two to the power of e. And the e min point is exactly the one that is the next one. Yeah, so the normalized uh, have the last point e equals e min. And then I take the next one e equals e min minus one. And what I just do is that this queen thing now here, so the stuff that is in front is now not the interval from one to two, it's the interval from zero to two. Yeah? Because this part here is the interval from zero to one. And now I have the two here, it's the interval from zero to two. So you can also see it like this, which is maybe um, a bit nicer, yeah? So, so this is the interval from zero to two. So I'm actually now filling the gap yeah, such that I include the zero. Okay, that's um, the representation of the floating point numbers. And you see that actually the E min is, well, the point, where we flip to another formula. No? So the computer, if the E changes to the E min minus one, uh, the computer um, changes a little bit the formula and we can represent then um, all the numbers. There was a third uh, set of uh, numbers, yeah. so numbers in a certain sense, special values. That was the case if the E was equal to E max plus one. Yeah? And so the whole range for the E is E min minus one to E max plus one. Uh, and these were the special numbers minus and plus infinity. Uh, and now comes a nice remark, yeah, which I didn't uh, made last time, uh, which I skipped a little bit. Uh, take a look at these encodings here. So it's C equals zero, E equals E max plus one. And consider these values that encode the special symbols, infinity, minus infinity, in our formula for the normalized floating point numbers. <clears throat> so these values, minus infinity and infinity can be seen as special numbers. So if we use now their encoding, C equals zero and E equals E max in the definition of a normalized floating point number. So minus one to the power of S, the sign one plus C divided by two to the power of P times two to the power of E. Then you see C is zero, so you have a one in front that minus infinity corresponds to minus two to the power of E max plus one and plus infinity corresponds to plus two to the power of E max plus one. So if I go back to the picture, I can actually draw plus and minus infinity in this uh, picture. So these are the powers of twos in the exponent. So the next one would be here and assume that that is really the last one, yeah? So assume that my um, exponent only has very few possible values. So then the last one is actually here and this is the plus infinity. And the minus infinity is actually here. Okay, so plus infinity is S equals zero, C equals zero, and E equals E max plus one. And that guy is S equal one, C equals zero, E equal E max. 
plus one. We will come back to this when we will discuss rounding, but this is now the complete picture. We are in addition, you also have this error code. Yeah? So if the C is not equal to zero, uh, this is just an error code, not a number. Then we ended the last session with um, a small uh, computer experiment. Yeah, we were a little bit playing around with the smallest possible positive floating point number, uh, you know, this tiny. And we observed that, for example, these two calculations here that looked uh, equivalent in a mathematical sense, just the ordering of the operations is different, gave different results. Yeah? So the first one is rounded to zero, the other one stays uh, at the value tiny. There was a third exercise here. What is the smallest x such that one and one plus two x are two different floating point numbers? And uh, we didn't manage to do this. And maybe I would start with this. It will come up later again, Yeah, but it's maybe a nice uh, motivation. Uh, and again, as I noted yesterday, you can find this code of the um, experiment here in our GitHub repository for the lecture. And this code is here in floating point arithmetic experiment. So maybe I just continue. And before we continue with the lecture, we have another nice small coding session. Uh, yeah, we already started creating this class here. That was the experiment from the last session where we created here with this loop, the number tiny, so I can run this. Yeah, and that was our output where we see that these two operations here give different result. So let's have um, another um, experiment with the smallest possible So the smallest positive number with two, one plus two X is not equal one. So these, are, these should be different. So that means one plus X is well, not larger than one. So it's maybe one. Okay, so uh, how I find this number, I do maybe something like we did here for the tiny. So um, I start with some, I would like to find a small number. So let's call it epsilon. I start with some epsilon uh, equal to one. And uh, then I check if one plus epsilon is still different from one. So is it still larger than one? If yes, then I make epsilon smaller. So I take epsilon equals epsilon divided by two. Okay, so mathematically the loop would run forever, but we will see that this loop does not run forever. And let's just print uh, the number that we have found. So what's that number? Okay, and then maybe we also check uh, what is one plus epsilon. Okay, so let's also print that. And maybe we also check if this number is equal to, to, to one. So is one plus epsilon equal to one? So I just make here a comparison. Is this equal to one? So let's, let's run that uh, little experiment. Uh, I made a nice mistake. So he's actually printing this here as a string. So he's printing the one and then he is printing the epsilon. So I should add a bracket here. <laughs> okay, so you see that one plus epsilon is indeed one. Yeah? So one plus epsilon is indeed one. And if I do the comparison here, 
one plus epsilon, is it equal to one? I get it true. But epsilon is not zero. So I have found a number, you know, and the number is small, but not that small. I mean, it's 10 to the minus 16, yeah? Uh, the other number we were looking here is really, really small, yeah? Uh, it's something five times 10 to the minus 324. So we found a small number. And if I add this number to one, it doesn't make a difference. And actually this guy is the root of all evil. Okay, and where is this number? Uh, first of all, let's make another check. If I do one plus two times epsilon, what do we get then? Okay, then we get really something that is different from one. So that here is a floating point number. So where, where is this epsilon? So actually the epsilon is exactly the floating point number that is between one and the next floating point number. So if you go back to our picture, if this here is the one, then maybe our epsilon is just the guy that is in between. Let's check that. So what's the distance? This distance here is exactly when the C jumps from zero, which gives me the one, to one. Yeah? So actually this point here is one plus one divided by two to the power of P. P was 52. So I would suspect that the epsilon is one half times that. So I would suspect that the epsilon is two to the power of 52, which is the P yeah, with a minus because it's one divided by, and then a minus one because I just been in, in between, yeah? so one half. So two to the power of 53. Let's print two to the power of 53. So this is two to the power of, sorry, minus, yeah, minus 53. Let's fix the typo. And indeed, yeah, that is our number epsilon. Okay. So the thing that one plus epsilon is equal to one uh, will cause uh, trouble and we will come back to this um, example in, well, a few minutes. So the next session I would like to discuss is now what happens if we perform arithmetic operations on this set. So the implementation of this IEEE 754 standard uses something that is called exact rounding of the result. So what does this mean? Well, if we perform a mathematical function plus minus, or for example, something like exponential, and this function is implemented according to the standard, then we know that the result of this function is rounded to the nearest representative in the set of the floating point numbers. So there is no additional error except the rounding error. So given that the operation is um, well-defined. So there is something called rounding. So this here is now our set of the floating point numbers. So we have our normalized floating point numbers. We have our denormalized floating point numbers. And we have our two special values, minus infinity and plus infinity. But these guys here are now interpreted as numbers. So that is the minus two to the power of E max 
plus one and the two to the power of E max plus one. Then if I interpret these guys uh, as numbers, uh, yeah, I can now define the rounding and the rounding is now given by a map that maps any real valued, valued number to a number in F by choosing the nearest representative. So the float of X is some X tilde in F such that the distance between X tilde and X is the minimum. Well, you already see from this definition that, okay, this definition is not yet defining all possible cases. It's not unique because I'm not yet telling you if we are rounding up or if we are rounding down, if we are in between. Yeah. And yeah, I, can't, uh, I, will, I will come to this. So now that I have my rounding operation, I can define what is the result of the mathematical function. So what does this exact rounding mean? So assume that we have values in my set of floating point numbers, because we only have these numbers uh, represented in the computer. And then I would like to apply some mathematical function to it. Uh, so for example, the plus operator uh, or the exponential or whatever, it can be a function of one argument of two arguments. Yeah. If then the implementation is provided under this standard. So if our corresponding computer implementation G tilde is provided to conform to this standard, then we know that G tilde applied to these numbers. I can apply it because these numbers are in the set of floating point numbers. Um, the result of this operation is the rounding of the true result. So we apply the mathematical function and then we perform our rounding. So this standard guarantees that a single atomic arithmetic operation does not produce an error larger than the rounding error. And we already know that um, the largest relative error that we can get from an operation on the normalized floating point numbers is one divided by two to the power of P plus one. So we already had a small, a small uh, uh, remark, remark on that. Of course, this uh, remark here only holds if I have a single, say, atomic operation. If we have multiple operations, the rounding error can accumulate, and we will see some nice um, examples uh, on this. So this value, not a number, is used as a result of undefined operations. For example, zero divided by zero, and uh, infinity divided by infinity. Or uh, if we have, for example, the square root of uh, minus one. However, uh, infinity yeah, are sometimes valid results. For example, if you take one divided by zero, yeah, you get infinity. Recall that we have two different zeros. There's a plus zero and a minus zero, and one divided by minus zero is minus infinity. So an important number is the machine precision, and the epsilon that we found here in our little experiment. So this number epsilon, where one plus epsilon is one, but one plus two epsilon is the next floating point number. Yeah? So the smallest floating point number larger than one. Uh, so epsilon is the number just in between. This guy is called uh, the machine precision or also sometimes uh, machine epsilon. And we already saw that is it is two to the power of minus P 
plus one. So if P is the number of bits representing the mantissa, so the values to discretize this uh, um, interval between one and two, then two to the power of minus P plus one is called the machine precision. Yeah, we already had these small questions. Okay, what is the relative distance of two normalized floating point numbers? And if X is in between two to the power of E min and two to the power of E max, so that means this number is a normalized floating point number. Then I know that the distance of two adjacent floating point numbers is the, the relative distance is at most two to the power of minus P. We had this little exercise. So when the distance of two neighboring floating point numbers is at most two to the power of minus P, then if I round to the nearest guy, yeah, the distance of an arbitrary number on this um, um, line to the next floating point number is two to the power of minus P plus one. Yeah? So two to the power of minus P half. So counting a number from the interval two to the power of E min to two to the power of E max to the nearest floating point number, this is delta times X with Delta smaller than two to the power of minus in bracket p plus one. So a small exercise for this: yeah? find uh, epsilon such that the floating point operation one plus epsilon is rounded to one but one plus two epsilon is not rounded to one. And we already did this. So this is the code that we just did in this little um, exercise Yeah, where I started this session. Actually, what happens if we look at the other values? So what is, one plus k times epsilon for k equals one, two, three, and four. So let's have a look at this. So how does the rounding behave in the other intervals? So I just continue here and maybe I just copy this line and we try out some other cases. So what is one plus one epsilon, what is one plus two epsilons and so on. Maybe you have some other cases here. Oops. Three, four, five, six. Okay, and why am I looking at this? Okay, we, we know that one plus epsilon is rounded down to one. One plus two epsilon is a floating point number yeah? because epsilon is just the half. Yeah? So this is actually one plus one divided by two to the power of P. So then the next one is one plus three epsilon. So that is in between one plus one divided by two to the power of P and one plus two divided by two to the power of P. So what would you expect? Is it rounded down to one plus two epsilon? So actually it's strange that it's rounded down. You would expect the convention that it's rounded up yeah, if it is 0 0.5, yeah, whatever. Uh, so what's happening? So let's try this. So you see, one plus epsilon is rounded down to one. One plus two epsilon is a floating point number. One plus three epsilon is rounded up to the next floating point number, which is one plus four epsilon. But then one plus five epsilon 
is rounded down. So the thing is that he is sometimes rounding down, sometimes rounding up, and it's actually alternating. So there's a funny thing here for um, a number that is one plus k epsilon to times uh, two to the power of e. Yeah. So depending on which scale we are, so we are here in some interval between two to the power of e and two to the power of e plus one. Uh, so this number lies exactly in between two floating point numbers. If k is odd, so if k is odd, I'm exactly in between two floating point numbers. And we just observed that the rounding is not always the same. So if k is odd, we have some rounding and the rounding depends on which value we are rounding. Actually, we saw that it just depends on the k and that's also uh, true, it just depends on the k. So this guy is rounded down. This guy here is rounded up. This guy was rounded down and this guy will be rounded up. And the constructors of this standard actually created this alternating rounding to avoid a systematic bias in numerical calculations. Because when you always round down, yeah, that can create um, a bias. Okay, so such alternating rounding are used to avoid a systematic uh, bias. Funny thing. I already introduced that minus infinity and plus infinity are maybe just numbers, no? namely the numbers two to the power of E max plus one and minus two to the power of E max plus one. So now if we go back to our picture, from my definition of the rounding, we have maybe something that is rounding to infinity. So if you have a number that is here, it will be maybe rounded to infinity. But if it is a little bit closer to the previous floating point number, like here, then it's maybe rounded to that guy. Of course, anything that is beyond here should be maybe rounded to infinity because it is just beyond. So how is this uh, looking? So the values minus infinity and plus infinity are just numbers. And we have some rounding to um, infinity. Let's play a little bit with this. So maybe I make my output a bit nicer. Yeah, let's have again here some kind of headline. And what are we doing now? Uh, we are doing small experiments. Well, I would like to do small experiments around the last possible value in my set of floating point numbers. So the last one that is not infinity. And this has actually um, a name. So this is called the max uh, value. So the max value will be um, two to the power of E max multiplied with one plus C is now two to the power of P minus one divided by two to the power of P. So it's actually uh, the one number between before the two to the power of E max plus one. So, but this guy uh, has um, a constant, so it has a name. So let's just maybe check what this guy is. So let's print this guy. Uh, 
Okay. So if you had here with the mouse pointer above, yeah, uh, this number, you see a constant holding the largest positive finite value of type double. And it is two to the power of E max, yeah, with in front a two times two, a two minus a one divided by P. Yeah? So one guy uh, before this. What happens if I add something to this? So maybe I just add 1,000. Mm, don't forget the brackets. Well, then I would expect that it's rounded back to the number. Okay, so, and this is happening. So you see the number is large, yeah, 1.8 times 10 to the 308. Yeah? So now this is base 10, 10 to the 308 is approximately the two to the power of 1000, whatever. Um, let's create maybe a big step, yeah? So, and what is now a big step in this scale? So surely I would like to have something in the range of two to the power of E max. So a big step is say something in the range of two to the power of 1,023. But then this is the step size now of the whole scale. I have the C divided by P. Yeah, so I go in steps of one divided by two to the power of 52. So maybe let's make the step a little bit smaller. Yeah. So that's now one discretization point. This is the one divided by two to the power of P multiplied with two to the power of E max. And let's go half step. So let's go 0.49 with this. Okay, so it is a big step, yeah, but maybe it's not so big that something is um, happening. So let's add this to the max double. Yeah, and maybe I also print what is the big step. So the big step is now that number, okay, so let, let this run. Oh, and we see we have here a quite big number. This is a 10 to the 291, but adding this big number to the max double uh, doesn't make a difference. We get the same number. So he's still rounding it back. Uh, let's maybe create an even bigger step. So I take my big step and create a bigger step. So let's take uh, an 0 0.5 times this. And let's print that. Okay, and suddenly it's rounded to infinity. Yeah. Uh, so you see that uh, infinity is not really very far away. Yeah? It is just the next number and suddenly we are rounded to um, infinity. Uh, of course, this means that if you come close to this region, then the infinity can be somewhat um, absorbing. Yeah? For example, surely if you add two such max double numbers, then you are beyond. But now if you subtract the max double again, it's infinity minus max double. Huh? So this is now max double plus max double. And then it's a minus max double. So 
I stay in, in infinity. Yeah. So you see, if you would make this in a different order, you would get something, something different. You can also try that. So let's first maybe do here the subtraction and then add the difference. Oops. Uh, sorry, there has to be, the bracket has to be here, right? Yeah, and of course we get just max double plus a zero. Yeah? So you see that fundamental laws are violated if we come close to, to this region. So we have something that is called uh, rounded to um, infinity. So the next topic is loss of significance and I'm coming now back to this thing that we have a epsilon where one plus epsilon is equal to one. And this is somewhat the root of a lot of problems. So the rounding will lead to the effect that one plus epsilon rounded to the nearest floating point number is the floating point number representing the one if epsilon is small enough. And an example is the solution of a quadratic equation, which you maybe know from school. So let's have a small exercise. Calculate the smallest solution of x squared plus px plus q is zero. And uh, maybe you remember that uh, there is a formula, so I like to calculate the smallest solution. So if I like to calculate the smallest solution, if the solution exists, that's the guy with the minus here. Well, this is one way which you maybe have learned to represent the solution. X is minus P half, so plus minus if it's two solutions, so then minus for the smallest one, minus square root, P half squared, uh, so P squared divided by four minus Q. Um, you can easily transform this solution in another form. Yeah? So if you have minus P half minus square root of P half squared minus Q, uh, then I can just multiply this with minus p half plus, so actually with the other solution, and divide by this again, now then you see that you get here minus p half squared, so plus minus the mixed term is vanishing, yeah. minus p half squared again, minus q. So I get a plus q. So actually this is just the q divided by the other solution. That's also maybe a formula which you have learned. Yeah? So you have this in an equivalent representation. And what is actually the most efficient, most accurate formula or are they both the same? So I would say that we just try this out. So I'll just try this in the computer. So there was a guess that we should maybe check uh, some parameters. So let's add maybe a small title here. What are we doing now? This is now an experiment on the loss of significance, solve a quadratic equation. So x squared plus px plus q equal zero. 
okay, so we defined the P. Uh, so there was a guess. So the P should be uh, 10 million, I believe. And the Q is or maybe minus 10 million. The Q is equal to one. Uh, one second, it is, I believe it should be minus 10 million. Maybe it's a typo. Let's see, 10, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, so 10 million, okay. Uh, then let's calculate the smallest solution. So I just write a small function, get smallest root of quadratic equation. And since we have two different versions uh, to doing this, this is say version one. Uh, and then I print uh, the parameters and the parameters are my P and my Q. And I also print the solution. So I call it the solution X1. So this is my solution. Well, and maybe we have to do a check, yeah? So let's print the check. And the check is now X squared plus P x plus q for x equal x1. So that's now my check. And what's that? Okay, so maybe I just write the formula here. So it's x squared, x times x plus p times x plus q for x equal x squared. So I would like to have this output and let's implement now this function. So you see he is complaining here. He doesn't know this function and he is suggestion, suggesting that I should create this function. So he gives me a small stop implementation, but of course I do not like to return zero. I would like to return the solution. The solution is minus P half. And then I would like the smallest solution minus square root of, P squared divided by four minus Q. <clears throat> okay, so let's run this program. Maybe I comment this out for a second here. So we get uh, with our parameter minus 10 million one, I get this solution, yeah. It's uh, like a 10 to the minus seven, nine times 10 to the minus eight. And let's try our little check now in addition. And that's an oops. Did I do something wrong? Hmm, this is not zero. So let's try maybe the second approach. So the second approach, maybe I call this X2, get smallest root of quadratic equation version two with P and Q. I just copy all this, but now my solution X2. So X2 is not the other root, it's now the other way of calculating this solution. And I make the check here, X2 squared plus P X2 plus Q. 
And I implement the other formula, which is mathematically equivalent. So the other formula is, let's have a check back. It's Q divided by the other solution. So it's Q divided by minus P divided by two plus the square root of P squared divided by four minus Q. Maybe I print a small space here so you can look at the printout a bit nicer. Okay, and we get hmm, now a slightly different solution. It's a 10 to the minus seven instead of the 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus eight. But if we perform the check, it is the solution, right? And check the code. I believe I have not done something wrong. Yeah? It's just the formulas that you know the one that you maybe know by heart and the other solution. So if you now change the coefficients here, for example, you change to something different like the 100 here, then you see that the problem is somewhat vanishing, yeah? Or If I make a plus here, then you get something different on the other side. So it truly depends on the parameters. And actually there is a, maybe a small typo here in the script. There should be a minus here because the nice example, which I discussed in the implementation is the one with a minus in front so that you can try this for yourself. But anyway, a large P um, is um, a problem. And actually why is the large P a problem? So. Can you explain why the two different ways of writing the solution differ so much in their floating point arithmetic? And the reason is of course related to the fact that P is quite large. And if you take a look what's happening here, if I have a minus here, the, this minus goes away. Yeah, uh, But of course here, this stays p squared half. And if the q would be zero, then this here and this here is actually canceling. So there are two large number that cancel. And the solution is more or less the q. Yeah? Uh, so related to the square root of the q. So if these two large numbers here cancel, it's important that the Q makes a difference. But now you see that I'm adding or subtracting a small number to a large number. So that's exactly the situation one plus epsilon or one minus epsilon. So if the Q doesn't make a difference, these two numbers cancel and the important information is lost. So this is related to the one plus um, epsilon equals to one problem. So code session, explore this. Uh, we already did some stuff, yeah? so test the machine precision epsilon test the properties of the max uh, double, the normalized floating point number, 
test uh, the properties of plus zero and minus zero. Maybe we did not do that and the plus infinity minus infinity. Yeah, so we can still do this and uh, check the quadratic um, equation. Maybe we check a little bit the plus zero and the minus zero and the plus infinity and the minus uh, infinity. So let's make some examples here related to plus and minus zero. So I mentioned that we have two different zeros. Okay, so how do I find now this zero? Well, if I make a number smaller and smaller, it will at a certain point be rounded to zero. So maybe just construct the zero. So let's define a guess. So it's one. And while my number is larger than zero, and maybe we should is not equal to zero, uh, then I make the number smaller. So plus zero is plus zero divided by two. And let's print this. Well, this number is plus zero. Okay, so what do we get? Yeah, we just get zero. Uh, now uh, I would like to make the same experiment, but I start with minus one. Yeah? So it's minus one, minus one half and so on. So I call this number say minus zero. And I make the minus zero smaller and smaller. And what do we get then? And you see, he really prints minus zero. So I get a different zero. So are these two different zeros different? So I can ask him if the two are different. So is plus zero equal to minus zero? So I just make here the test. Yeah? So my plus zero, is it equal to my minus zero? Yes, this is true. So he can print two different values. So actually he must have stored that the sign is different, but of course the zero is still a zero. So what sense does it make to distinguish these two guys? I already mentioned this. For example, if you have one divided by plus zero, so let's print one divided by plus zero. Then we get, whoops. then we get infinity. But if we do the one divided by minus zero, we get the minus infinity. So the two enter into uh, the arithmetic operations um, differently. Uh, well, also make some experiments with respect to infinity. Uh, if we have two different infinities, minus infinity and plus infinity, and the two different infinities are just numbers, uh, what happens if I do plus infinity plus minus infinity? Okay, what, what, what's that? Um, just define the plus infinity. 
is the one divided by the plus zero. Okay, you can you can also just ask him for this. Yeah, so if you have your double dot, yeah, you see negative ex infinity exists as a constant. But now we have nicely constructed it arithmetically, and I define the minus infinity as one divided by minus zero. Okay, so if I have this, I can now maybe just print these two guys so that you believe these are now our plus and the minus infinity. Now, you see, I get these two, two guys. Um, then let's check what is plus infinity plus minus infinity. Okay, so what, what would you guess this is? Is this a zero? Well, from this interpretation that these are just numbers, it is a zero, but we get this not a number, uh, which is nice because, so why is this nice? The problem is that we are rounding to infinity whenever we come too close to this number representing infinity, but also when we are far beyond. So uh, it may be that one guy is very far beyond. It's two times infinity, for example, in, in the sense of this number. And the other one is not so far beyond. So it's completely unclear what is this uh, difference of the two large number or the sum of the very large number and the very, very small number. Um, so it's completely unclear, and he is indicating this with an error with, with another number. The another number is also something like an absorbing state. Uh, whenever you have another number in your argument list, you will get another number in the result because it is unclear uh, how the output uh, relates to the floating point numbers. So the not a number is also, for example, the result of taking the square root of minus one. Yeah? So it's an error in, uh, indicator. Oops, what's happening here? So it's indicating an, 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 an error. Okay, so we will get uh, not a number. If you have not a number in, uh, say, in operation, you will get not a number. So you can create not a number. So let's create this by taking the constant double dot and a NAN, yeah? so maybe I just print this out. What, what is now this guy? Okay. Um, if you have an operation with not a number, Say I now calculate one plus, not a number. Of course, I just get not a number. So it's an absorbing state. What happens if I take an operation on infinity? Yeah. So let's say we do one plus infinity. Is that then not a number? Uh, 
let's check that. So one plus infinity is infinity. Yeah? So that also makes sense. So we already know we are, the result is say close to infinity or beyond. And he knows then whenever you add something to this, it is also close to infinity or beyond. Yeah? So that's not, not a number, but in some cases where you cannot decide, uh, it will be not a number. A last thing is, if you have two results that move to this error state, so two results move to not a number, then are these two numbers then considered to be equal because both are an error? So let's have uh, X say or, or E1 be not a number and E2 is also not a number and check are, the two, are these two equal? So I'm actually checking is not a number equal to not a number. So that looks a bit strange. And I'm checking this. Is E1 equal to E2? And that is false. Yeah? So he cannot say that it's equal because both are errors, both are completely undetermined states. It could be any number. Yeah? So I could even write here E2 is equal to E1. And the check that the two are equal is still false. Actually, you will see, you have, you have to have this in mind that not a number compared to anything is false, yeah? uh, but uh, that's actually um, a, nice, uh, a, nice, a nice property. So that was uh, our code session on the floating point number double. And as mentioned, you can check this out and play a little bit with this. So in my last session in the session on floating point numbers is on summation. And maybe we do this uh, next time because it is important for us, but I already mentioned this in the very beginning in my motivation that calculating the sum of just very simple numbers can create problems. And now maybe you have already a guess, what is the issue here? If we do a Monte Carlo simulation, then this N here may be very large. So, if you then define the algorithm as calculating the sum by just adding all the number, so you have SK is SK minus one plus XK, yeah? and you have say S zero is S zero, then you see that if you add many small numbers, then it could happen that you have a large number here and a small number here. So it's like the one plus epsilon. So you are adding small numbers to large numbers to create the sum very often. And adding a small number to a large number may have an issue. So that guy may become large, even for small XK. So that links to the one plus epsilon is one issue.
Okay, so that was it for today. We will do a summation uh, next time. And there will be a very nice and famous algorithm, the Kahan summation, uh, which fixes the error propagation problem uh, very nicely for the summation. And we will need this in our Monte Carlo simulations. Thank you. <laughs>